So this will be then on the topic of energy efficiency, which is, of course, very important uh, in the context of neural circuits. And we heard several uh, of those uh, neural circuits yesterday, sessions on neomorphic computing as well as, as on deep learning. Oh, <laughs> I think I'm going up rather than going down, sorry. So there has been great excitement um, in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, and um, so just last year we had this, this amazing uh, results of, of um, a machine beating the human. Right? This was um, then uh, Google DeepMind versus um, uh, Lisa Dahl, the, the Go world champion, who was um, just defeated in, in a, uh, a very um, um, emotionally embarrassing manner here, as you see on the right. Um, but what's really going on here, a few points to be made here. Uh, so first of all, this is not old school AI. This was actually neural circuits, deep learning uh, neural networks at play. That's one observation. And the other observation here is that the comparison is not quite as, as fair as, as you would want it to be, right? So sure, this was um, uh, deep learning, but it also was um, uh, deep mind uh, using basically uh, Google's deep pockets, right, of, of almost infinite resources in data and, and power here. So basically uh, 100 kilowatts versus then uh, about 100 watts being very generous here in the power. It's more like I said, 10 watts of, or, or 15 watts of power uh, in, in the brain. So clearly you can do much better here in terms of energy efficiency. And that's what motivated actually 30 years ago or 25 years ago, uh, neuromorphic uh, engineering. Um, and uh, it's important to, uh, um, to go into this, not just from uh, a cognitive level in terms of performance, which was pursued by AI, but also looking at deeper physical foundations, which are, which are there as well. Right, so take inspiration from biology, not only in, in the function, but also in the structure and, and organization, in which they can also inherit then its, its great, um, the, the, the great uh, energy efficiency of computing the brain, as well as its um, uh, great resilience to operate under noise, imprecision with the environment and, uh, and uncertainty. Right, so about 30 years ago, uh, the field of neuromorphic engineering was actually um, uh, started as a synergy at the very physical, uh, this foundation of physical, uh, physical uh, uh, manner uh, by um, uh, Richard Feynman, who told us, um, in fact, uh, th there's also a lot of room at the bottom. Um, and that started really because the, the field of nanotechnology for, for uh, and, and the events we we're noticing here uh, today. And also um, Carver Mead, right, who helped then also launch the field of because, um, uh, digital system synthesis, right, which really was uh, pushing then integrated circuits towards a sy system perspective that allowed them all the advances in information technology. But those two also, uh, just lesser known, at the same time um, advocated this, the, the principle of an analysis by synthesis, in which, as if you look at what, what uh, Richard Feynman was telling us, this was actually his blackboard just the day before before he died. Um, right? So what I cannot create, I do not understand. So in order to, to understand really what's going on in, in the brain, you actually need to be able to synthesize brains. And Cover Me took this to heart and actually started this field of neuromorphic engineering, basically building artificial, uh, artificial brains in, in, in silicon. And to understand this endeavor here, so indeed we have this analysis and synthesis that go together. Analysis is basically neuroscience, uh, synthesis engineering, um, and this has to happen at, at all different uh, scales in representation, right? So you have, because at the, the bottom layer, you have the physics all, all the way from ion transport um, through ion channels, which has physical isomorphisms in then transistors operating in subthreshold. In fact, the steep slope that we're discussing because, uh, at, at this meeting, um, Right, has also analogies of, of um, Boltzmann physics with ion channels, but there the slopes are much steeper than, than actually that we're discussing today and yesterday. Slopes in the order of um, a few millivolts per, per decade achieved through correlated ion transport. So there's something to be learned there as well. And then the higher layers, you also have physical isomorphisms then, uh, uh, of, of Boltzmann machines and, and uh, learning. Um, that can also be harnessed for, for uh, building uh, machines that, 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 that are intelligent. 
Um, so here's also important um, to note that some of this massively parallel computing, distributed computing, that now today is, is referred to as non-von Neumann computing is actually very unfair to von Neumann who actually 50 years ago started this field, started looking into how the brain is organized in, in, in this, this uh, parallel computation. And I guess still 50 years later, we're still doing mostly serial uh, or sequential computing and, and having this, this uh, di discrepancy between uh, memory and compute operations. There's nothing to be learned here. Right? So and, and, uh, in order to, um, to quantify efficiency, uh, going towards extremely efficient uh, learning machines, it's important, of course, to look not just at, at the, um, the energy, but also at what, it, what is being done by the energy. And then here we consider task complexity, right, on a log scale. The vertical axis here is, is then uh, the machine complexity, right, which translates to power and other metrics. And you can think of this vertical axis as basically Moore's law, where uh, each, right, because um, we had, had a, um, a logarithmic increase in, in um, well, an exponential increase in density. So on the log scale is basically linear, um, basically a linear climbing up of this, of this ladder. And now we're reaching a limit here. We can't go any further uh, given, uh, the, given the physical limits. The assumption all the way along with Moore's law has been that in order to get better performance, we just scale things, uh, scale things up. And it has been great, but clearly uh, more can be done by re reorganizing the computation in different matters. And this is now what's really driving the latest advances in deep learning and, and, and machine intelligence in which uh, this, uh, this, this, this uh, what used to be a linear trade-off between machine complexity and task complexity with digital search and exact methods for computing are now being replaced with more this, um, collective analog computation, non phenomenon computing that is inspired by basically the approximate reasoning that this happens uh, that, that takes place in, in, in this, how, how the brain is organized. Right, and so it's important to look at, at the energy per task um, in, so basically this can be decomposed in energy per operation, which can be optimized through um, uh, engineering, but also operations per task, right? You can minimize the amount of computation to be done in the first place, and that will also then bring down your overall energy, right, for improvement in efficiency, right? And, and so there you can get, um, uh, so in, in, the, in the neuromorphic engineering effort, uh, right, you can get down to um, e e energy levels of about a femtojoule for synaptic operation. So here we're, we have massively power operation. So the, the synaptic operation is, is the key metric here, uh, so the energy per synaptic operation. And then at the same time, by deep learning and, and uh, also um, uh, adapting deep learning approaches to the physics of the medium, you can also then uh, uh, further improve basically um, have a few operations for doing a given task, for instance here for, for the digit uh, classification. So it's important to have the synergy of, of then um, neuromorphic engineering and deep learning, uh, um, uh, both the hardware developments at the device level and, and circuits level, and then algorithmic advances in, in learning and then computer science uh, for this to, to happen. Right? And uh, so indeed we have these different disciplines, in fact also represent, uh, represented um, here at, at the meeting uh, the day yesterday, right? Where um, definitely uh, advances in nanotechnology are extremely important towards the densities that are uh, necessary for reaching the level of complexity of, of say the human brain. Uh, but at the same time also then it's important to have this deep learning and other approaches right, to abstract the complexity of, of the, of the um, environment. Um, into a representation that even though it, it seems daunting of having 10 to the 15 synapses that, you're, that you need to have on, on this chip to, to get close to human cognitive performance, still you need to be able to abstract the um, um, complexity of the world into, into those, those 10 to Okay, so, so here's a comparison of then um, recent large-scale uh, neuromorphic um, uh, devices. 
Uh, and so we go here for cognitive performance. So we're looking at, at large scale, um, right? Where um, uh, deep learning can be used for them training those, those, those uh, machines. And most of those are actually doing inference and not learning. So basically learning is then done off chip. And then once the system is trained, then the, the, the weights are then projected because on, on those chips. Uh, so we have some digital chips. So the ones on the left, the, the two ones on the left here. Sorry. Uh, the two ones on the left here are digital chips. So you have um, Spinnaker developed at Manchester. Then you ha here you have uh, IBM True North, which is an asynchronous digital chip. And then you have uh, 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 three analog chips on, on the right here. It's the Heidelberg uh, Facet Brain Scale chip. So both this Facet Brain Scale chip and Spinnaker, those were developed through the Human Brain Project. Um, uh, Synapse, um, uh, IBM, so the IBM chip was developed through the, uh, the DARPA Synapse program. Um, we also have the Stanford um, uh, Neurogrid chip developed by Quivin Wannon here uh, I guess, um, um, recently. And here's our, our chip developed at UCSD, right, where we had um, also similar <coughs> performance. So the key here is that you can look at size and complexity. Uh, the bottom line is energy efficiency, joules per synaptic events, and now we're, uh, all the systems are approaching more or less uh, energy efficiency is in the order of a few tens of picojoule per synaptic event. And so that's great, um, but yet uh, most of those are limited then by, still by memory access, right? And, and for making further advances, and then um, it's important to, to, to have better matching between this processing power that you have in this for neuromorphic computing, but then also the memory capacity and, and, and the interface it gives it a bandwidth. Uh, here's another way of, of looking at, at this. Right? It's important to, uh, for this to scale, uh, to have both flexibility in how you, uh, you can reconfigure the network with 10 to the 15 synapses. Clearly in our brain we have 10 to the 12 neurons. Not every neuron is connected to every other neuron. That would be 10 to the 24 synapses. So you have sparsity in the connectivity. So and, and even though most of those connections are local, just in the direct neighborhood, there's still a significant fraction of neurons that will fan out and making connections all the way to the other side of the brain. So long range connectivity is extremely important. Uh, but this, still you want to have the capability of each neuron to connect to, in principle every other neuron, right? So combination of expandability, so scalability and, and efficiency in how you can reach a uh, long range as well as flexibility in which each neuron can connect to other neuron are both important. And typically has been this trade off between the two, but so now there are systems, uh, Spinnaker and then also higher, the system we, we developed, in which by using a hierarchical representation, right, basically small world um, I guess, um, uh, networks, I guess, uh, hierarchical representations in trees, combined then with uh, arbitrary connectivity, can give you then uh, I guess, um, flexible and yet uh, expandable connectivity in, in, in normal for computing. And that's extremely important for scaling up uh, the systems, right? So here's an example of what we call a higher uh, IFAT. Higher stands here for hierarchical address event representation. And IFAT stands for integrated and fire array transceivers. So the principle here is that when a uh, neuron fires, it connects to other neurons, to synapses, right? Um, and the way this can be done efficiently is by uh, going into tables, memory, or the, or the, where you define the connectivity, because in, in basically virtual uh, uh, fashion, so this allows you to dynamically reconfigure your network very easily. Um, and then you have those integrated fire rate receivers, right, that uh, are with addressable neurons, uh, right, uh, so you have synaptic inputs addressed coming in, and then when neuron fires, it requests an address, uh, um, um, an, an event coming out with the address of the neuron. And so this way you can construct, in principle, arbitrary neural networks. To scale this up, you need to have this hierarchical means for um, um, for partitioning your network, uh, where you have mostly local connectivity, and then you have this global connectivity taken care of by routing basically events, uh, neural events, because, uh, through uh, the hierarchy. Right, so you have these local elements with um, uh, integrated fire array transceivers with uh, local memory defining these connections, and then you have uh, a network. I can see here is, is a board. You can have a rack of those boards, and then you can have a supercomputer center, and then multiple, super, uh, multiple centers can be combined together with the internet for building very large networks, right, as a scalable uh, thing. So this operates at about 22 picojoules per um, um, synaptic event, which is perhaps great, but not the best we can do. And the, the bottleneck here is really then 
the memory bandwidth. So in order to do better than that, we need to have means for directly connecting uh, those neural processors to uh, uh, memory elements. And those resistor, resistive um, uh, memory technologies, such as PCM, so patient's memory, as well as resistive RAM, and other ones you have heard uh, about uh, today and yesterday, are great because not only they're, they're, they're good for non-volatile storage, but they also are implementing inherently a synapse, a conductive based synapse. Because what is a synapse after all in the brain? You have a presynaptic neuron action potential that activates this conductance between the reverse potential and, and the postsynaptic membrane. And then you have those currents, those conductances that, that couple, and so this current basically sum in the soma for giving rise then to the action potential on, on the postsynaptic side. So each element can be seen as directly a synapse that is activated by presynaptic action potential. Right? So you can have spike-based computation that can take advantage of the same elements rather than having to um, uh, use this as a digital memory. So you can have a, a full um, in-memory compute capability where each memory element is actually a full uh, computation element, multiply mode. Right, so at Stanford, uh, Philip Wong's uh, group developed um, uh, those amazing technologies then for, for actually also training those crossbar arrays with those um, uh, fascist memory and also RERAM uh, technologies right, um, for implementing synapse arrays right, that adapt uh, based on what is called spike time independent plasticity is a biological rule that tells you right, how a, a network will adapt itself, it will change the way it's according to activity that is spike based, just based on timing, relative timing of spikes. Right? And, um, and so, so now we're actually taking this technology and, and putting it on top of CMOS, where then in CMOS we actually have this, the neurons implementing those integrant fire array transceivers, uh, with, which can also be addressed for long range connectivity. And then locally have this highly dense, efficient uh, uh, local connectivity of, of, of basically synapses on top of this, this um, um, uh, PCM or RM synapses on top of, of, of your CMOS. Right? So that's about technology. And in this way, we think we can go down to femtojoules of, of, of synaptic operations. Um, but again, so I mentioned, it's extremely important also to look at the, algori uh, the algorithmic side of things. And uh, so here we also looked at. Um, Boltzmann machines and how to officially implement them uh, for uh, neuromorphic computing. And you heard about Boltzmann machines yesterday as, as a means for doing stochastic neural computation in a massively parallel system that exploits um, uh, the uh, inherent stochasticity medium to solve very hard problems that, that, that otherwise you, um, that is cannot be done with deterministic uh, schemes. So here in a Boltzmann machine, you have noise as an added mechanism. So um, what we actually, so the brain actually has plenty of noise that is available there for free at the synapse level. In fact, our synapses in the brain fail about 50% of the time, right? So a presynaptic action potential doesn't actually reach, right, the postsynaptic side with, right, uh, due to many factors, the release of, of neurotransmitter uh, and also binding on, on, on the postsynaptic side. So those are stochastic processes that fail about 50% of the time, and yet we're doing so great in, in neural computation. So the reason why I think is because that stochasticity is, 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 can be harnessed. It's a great thing. And so uh, we actually harness this, this stochasticity and basically having this, those uh, synaptic connections being stochastic as a an, as an multiple, multiplicative rather than an additive noise mechanism that actually performs better than Boltzmann machines in doing inference and learning, where the learning is then implemented using an online, an online unsupervised uh, form of, 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 uh, of, of contrasted divergence, which is the learning algorithm used for Boltzmann machines, based on the same spike time dependent plasticity can be implemented with this RM technologies. Right? And RM is also great for stochasticity. Yes, yes, you, you, uh, RM and PCRM are great for stochasticity. And doing this, actually, we, we get um, faster convergence, fewer operations than a digital Boltzmann machine that's implemented, right? Uh, on, on, a, uh, on a digital uh, machine. So fewer operations, fewer synaptic operations uh, than the multiply cumulus that you need in a digital machine emulating uh, the Boltzmann machine. Um, yesterday we also had a question, so what are now the limits uh, of energy efficiency and how does, the, um, and why would we want to go on the edge? Right? So what I presented so far as a means actually that doesn't have to go off the edge. You can have those, you can have farms of those general purpose machines for doing very large problems, such as because what DeepMind has been doing. And, and so there's a way forward there for, for, for tackling very hard problems. But you, know, you can also ask yourself, can we have also more efficient means, right, 
It gives us extremely low power interfacing, say, with sensors. And yes, you can. So you can even get great advances. If you know exactly what algorithm you're doing, you can implement this, this in, in, in hardware. And so here are examples of, of where you have sensors coupling them to systems that we can think of as smart ADDs, smart analog vision converters, because you do some analog signal processing, and then out comes a digital answer, right? That actually has more information about your problem than, uh, than you would be uh, getting if just by ADD conversion. Here's an example of what we call a, uh, the Conotron, which was, uh, it was developed, I guess, now 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, uh, as an ad adiabatic support vector machine on silicon. Right, support, uh, support vector machines are means are other learning machines right, that are based on, on um, um, uh, advances in uh, statistical learning theory. Um, basically, you can think of those as massively parallel template matching processors. And, each, and, and so here we have an array of, of uh, elements, charge domain elements that are both uh, doing storage of a template uh, element and also then doing the compute by basically capacitive coupling. And by recovering charge in the process, right, rather than wasting it, so re recovering it in, an, in a non-destructive manner as, as a uh, capacitive readout, uh, and also then combined with some adiabatic techniques for recovering also the charge for driving the lines, right, with the inputs, right, we're able to get about a teramax per milliwatt, which is basically femtojoule of better than a femtojoule of operation for synaptic operation. And this still had been, I guess, a record. This was 10 years ago. Now the latest uh, machine learning systems or inference machines are getting at that level, but now, today, those machine, those are using deep submicron technologies in, on, 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 at the um, 20 or below nanometer node. This was basically 250 nanometer, basically 0.25 micro technology. Right, so the principle here was basically using uh, resonance in adiabatic coupling between external tank and internally to you have your capacitive, I guess, uh, uh, load implied by your, your uh, charge domain computing element. And at resonance, basically, if, if you make sure that the activity is about balanced, that it goes halfway with stochastic computing, you can hit it nicely where you actually recover most of the energy. And, and that's how you were able to do this. Um, another system, um, how many minutes do we have? I think I'll wrap up here, yes. Right, so, and you can also take this to another extreme, right, where if you have now multiple, uh, let's say you have an array of antennas, right, um, right, you can do the single, so you can do the single processing in here, for instance, for doing adaptive beam forming, right, at an effective 14 bit of resolution, right, basically dynamic range of 90 dB. Um, uh, and this way you can bypass the needs for high resolution ADD conversion and you can drastically reduce the power, not just the power, right, so if you were to, to, to go to an ADC directly and then have a DSP for doing computation, your path will be dominated by the ADC. So now you do some analog processing for doing this beam forming, um, and then you can dramatically relax the power here, and the power of the, the, this analog sync processing is actually still quite good. In this case, it was basically two picojoule per multiply cumulative in the analog domain using charge domain computing. Um, so, so definitely with um, um, dedicated architectures, you can do very well energy efficiency, but even also in this general purpose computing, you can do quite well as well. And, and so I think there's a path forward towards femtojoule level computing, general purpose computing with uh, no more fake devices. Well, please there. Were they all based on crossbar arrays? I'm referring to the BrainScale S machine, the Stanford NeuroGrid, and the US, uh, UCSD uh, IFAT. Uh, are they all? Uh, none uh, of them are, no. So none of them are cross. So in what sense are they analog? Well, they're analog because uh, the circuits used for implementing the, the neural dynamics use transistors, right, for, for, for conductances, mm -hmm. use capacitors for integrating the values, right? Um, but the memory storage is still um, mostly off-chip. Uh, some of those have actually on-chip storage, but this was limited to some capacitor on, on, on I guess, uh, right? Um, so, so, and, and we're still waiting to see uh, neuromorphic computing at scale. They'll be using uh, RM or, or PCRM elements, and this is a work in progress. So, so Philip and I actually work in this area, and yeah. there's other groups too. But so, so, so we're still waiting to see this, this very large scale 
um, integrated um, uh, memistor elements to really make an impact in, in, in the world of engineering. But hold on, we'll be in the in the near future. So. So I have a question about uh, this is stochasticity. So the results that you show um, are, are fantastic, that the stochasticity actually makes it more efficient. But what is the uh, physical insight behind it? Uh, why does it make it so efficient? So you're referring to um, the chronotron, right? right? So, well, basically, we, um, you have an array of those compute elements, right? And so uh, you're transferring the charge, the output, when your input is a one, you don't transfer it when the input is a zero. So then the actual the charge coupling that you have uh, or the, the, the capacitive load that you have in your computation depends on the data. So if you can somehow modulate your data, to be, right? Basically, as I told the sigma blade, if you can modulate or noise shape your data, um, right? Then, then um, you can assure that on average, you have the same number of elements that you're actively you're driving and then you can ensure that this capacitance that you have, the capacitive load is constant, and then you can tune your, your, your system at that resonance, right? This is an example where tuning a system at resonance by uh, modulating the, the, the computation was able to, to get there. But there are probably other, there, there may be other good reasons for using stochastic computation. Stochastic resonance, for instance, right? Okay, uh, are there any other?